From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Welcome to Hollywood, Mr. Dollar. This is Daryl. Daryl? Uh, Jim Daryl. Daryl and Clark Insurance. We wrote up the palm quiz policy. Oh, that Daryl. For a minute, I thought maybe... Yeah, yeah, everyone does. Uh, about the policy. Understand you're worried about it. National Underwriters is. They asked me to take a look. Come on over and help yourself. It's a simple enough policy. $100,000 coverage on both Dr. Carl Palmquist and his wife. It's that double indemnity clause I'm interested in. It becomes effective the end of this week, doesn't it? That's right. Why? What's wrong? An anonymous letter sent to underwriters. Kind of hints that somebody's going to try to collect. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to National Underwriters Association, 1180 River Road, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the long shot matter. Expense account item one, $174.90. Airfare and incidentals to Hollywood, California. A good night's sleep at the Beverly Hilton Hotel and in the morning sunshine, Hartford's slush was only a clammy memory. Nobody walks in California, so when in Rome... Item two, two dollars even. Cab fare to Daryl and Clark Insurance Brokers. Beverly Hills, where else? Come on in, Dollar. Won't be a minute. Grab a chair. One look at the furnishings and you knew a lot of insurance was sold here. It takes a flock of premiums to pay for the really good modern, the long, clean, functional stuff. Impressive. Jim Daryl was even more so, and I'd have bet that 90% of his policyholders were women. He seemed to be doing two things at once, shaving and keeping track of passers-by in the street outside. I watched him glance quickly out the window for the fifth time, smile happily, then make a check mark on a desk pad. Ah, huh. I give up. What is it? Uh, electric shaver. I mean the bit outside the window. Oh, it's uh, this year's version of counting license plates. You playing alone? Uh-uh. With Clark, my partner. You see, he takes charcoal gray suits and I take Bermuda shorts, based on strictly how many pass the window. The other side of the street doesn't count. Loser buys lunch. Where's Clark? Seeing a prospect. We play on the honor system. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Darrell. Uh, there, that's better. Yeah, uh, palm quiz policy, huh? You uh, want to know about it. Well, you sound reluctant. It's delicate. So is this letter. Look into palm quiz policy. You may have to pay off soon. Nice corny touch there. Letters from a magazine pasted on to form the message. Well, the style's a little old hat, but the meaning's clear enough. You want to fill me in? The palm quiz, Mr. Dollar, the last of one of our oldest families out here. Name, social position, money. They've got it all. That's why I'm not too impressed with this little, uh, communique. You were telling me about the family. Palm quiz, the doctor, an important one. Six-dish, to the manner born. Complete with iron-gray hair and distinguished bearing. A, uh, knows-what-he-wants type of man. Has a tremendous practice and still finds time to go hunting about two months out of every year. And his wife? Invalid, confined to the house. A huge house, by the way, out near the beach. And there's a son, Eric, 25, who lives with him. That's the family. About the policy, Daryl. Simple enough. 100,000 straight coverage on both Dr. Palmquist and his wife. And the beneficiaries? Only one, the son Eric. For both? For both. Hmm. That's a pretty pointed grunt. Why not? I was thinking of the double indemnity clause that'll be effective in a few days. That's what I thought you were thinking. Well, let me have a couple of addresses, will you? The house at the beach and Palmquist's office. Sure. The uh, office is only a few blocks from here. And, uh, Dollar, please be tactful, will you? Those premiums... They're so lovely. Well, the way to make sure they keep coming is to keep people healthy. Yeah, I guess you have some... Hey, what do you know? Another one. What? Uh, Bermuda shorts. Oh, that puts me three up. Clark's going to scream like an eagle when he pays that lunch check. Today we eat at Romanoff's. I walked the four or five blocks to Dr. Carl Palmquist's office. It was easy to find. You just look for the most expensive building in the most expensive part of Beverly Hills, or as the natives sometimes call it, Lootville. As I turned into the entrance, a young executive type brushed past me on the street. Suit? Charcoal gray. I hoped he wouldn't pass Daryl's window. Dr. Palmquist's office was all it should be. Tasteful, quietly lush, the kind of place that made you wonder why he didn't live right there. The nurse who came forward did nothing to destroy the thought. Blonde, complete with doe eyes, retrousse nose, and a figure that floated. Great medicine for the sick. May I help you? 
I'd like to see the doctor. You have an appointment, Mr. Dollar, Johnny Dollar. No, I haven't. Dr. Palmquist isn't in right now. Well, what time will he be back? Well, he has a 4.30 appointment. Suppose I show at 5, then, Miss... Lund. Steffi Lund. Miss Lund. 5? I can't promise anything, but you might try. Oh, I will. I'll try like mad. Expense account item three, thirty-eight dollars even. Deposit and first day's rental on a drive-it-yourself car. And driving it out along Sunset Boulevard was delightful. I had no trouble at all getting into the California spirit. I pretended that I was a movie producer going home to his starlet wife. I found the Palmquist house on a quiet dead-end street high on the Palisades overlooking the Pacific. Daryl was right. It was huge, a single-story farmhouse that seemed to ramble endlessly. It was a long way to come for nothing. I walked around the side of the house. Nobody tried to stop me. I moved through an open breezeway and wished that somebody had, because suddenly I felt like an intruder, because of the woman sitting in the wheelchair, staring vacantly down at the swimming pool that sparkled in the sunlight, because of the way she poured a drink from the bottle beside her without ever looking at it, because of the way she held the glass as though she wanted you to believe it was sarsaparilla tea, not whiskey. It's... Isn't really medicine, you know. I only pretend that it is. Yeah, sure. Look, I, I didn't mean to barge in like this. Uh, Mrs. Palmquist? Victor says it's disgusting. Calls it a sign of weakness. Do you feel that way, young man? Well, uh, <clears throat> nobody does anything without a reason... Um, my name is Dollar, Mrs. Palmquist, and, well, I'd, I'd like to talk to you for a little while, if, if you feel up to it. Weakness. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's... Very sorry. Victor wouldn't like that, either. Would you mind wheeling me into the house, young man? I'm very tired. Oh, yeah, sure thing. You just relax. She leaned back in the chair and closed her eyes. She wasn't sleeping, just somewhere off in thoughts of her own. I pushed the sh chair toward the house as gently as I could. It wasn't until we almost reached it that I realized we had an audience, a good-looking kid in his mid-twenties watching us from a bedroom window. A kid who didn't want to be seen the way he jumped back from the window told me that. It was getting pretty weird out. Inside the house, I wheeled Mrs. Palmquist into a large living room. Gently, patiently, I tried to get her to answer a few questions, but I got nowhere. She wasn't rude, just secretive, smiling, and very far away. I was wondering how to get out gracefully when... I'm so very sorry. I'm afraid I haven't been very attentive, have I, Mr. Dollar? Suddenly, just as clear and lucid as that. I looked around to see what had made this almost magical change, and he was standing just inside the room, the kid I'd seen watching from the window. Eric, come here, dear. This is my son, Eric. I'm afraid I've forgotten where you told me you were from, Mr. Dollar. I... My mother's been ill, Mr. Dollar. She's not supposed to be disturbed. Oh, now, here... Oh, I am sorry. I was just leaving. Good. I'll show you the way out. Oh. Maybe that would be best. You'll come back again, Mr. Dollar, when I'm feeling better. Yeah, sure, of course. Please make it soon. I don't seem to keep... Very good track of time. Another sign of weakness, I suppose. Well, I... Uh... When you show Mr. Dollar out, please come back, Paul. Oh, yes, Mother. You're a good son, Paul. Uh, this way, Mr. Dollar. What do you want here? You can see she isn't well. Yeah, yeah. It didn't take you long to go from Eric to Paul, did it? She is not insane. You hear, Mr. Dollar? I didn't say she was. Now, why did she call you Paul? Paul was my older brother. He died three years ago. That's part of why she's like she is. A small part. Oh, I'm sorry. Nobody's asking you to be. Just don't come back here. <laughs> 
I had plenty of time to kill before five o'clock, and a lot of things would have been pleasant. Sopping up the Malibu sun, watching the kids on the beach, you name it. But instead, I settled for a visit with an old friend, Lieutenant Barry, homicide. I wasn't just being social. Pretty sneaky, as a matter of fact. The anonymous note which underwriters had received intrigued Barry, and he promised to have it gone over by the police lab. At five on the dot, I was back in Dr. Palmquist's office. Hi. You're a punctual sort of patient, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, I used to get gold stars for it at school. Well, I'm afraid Dr. Palmquist doesn't get one. He called just a little while after you left this morning. Oh? He said to cancel all appointments for today that he wouldn't be in. I'm so sorry. Yeah, so am I. I would have called you, but I didn't know where to reach you. Oh, sure, that's okay. What about tomorrow? I can give you an appointment at 10. How's that? I'll be here. Thanks. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar, would you like to give me some information now? Like what? Medical history, previous illnesses, complaints, the usual thing. Saves time in the morning. Well, why don't we wait till tomorrow, in case Dr. Palmquist decides to play hooky again? There's one nice thing about this job. You get around so much you learn to pick up local habits without even thinking about it. For instance, that evening, I had a leisurely dinner, then took in an endless double feature, all without ever once getting out of my car. Drive in, you know. It was well after midnight when I got back to my hotel, feeling a kinship for bus drivers everywhere. I headed across the lobby, ran smack into Jim Darrell as I rounded the cigar stand. Whoa! Oh, dollar. Where have you been? Well, hi, Darrell. Hey, who wound up paying for lunch? Listen, I've been trying to get hold of you all night. Where were you? Dinner, a movie, the wildlife, huh? Well, don't look that unhappy. I didn't do anything illegal. Somebody did. What? Hey, what is it, Daryl? What are you talking about? Mrs. Palmquist. Dead. Shot to death a couple of hours ago. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, variations on an old theme. You pays your money and you takes your choice. But no matter how you pick it, it comes out murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Tony Barrett. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Roy Rowan speaking.